the problem is people who are living in these beautiful buildings in Manhattan, for example, are like, no, 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 we don't want these people in our neighborhood. And a lot of that comes from the perception of our neighbors on the street. But they right. realize that 70% of people who are homeless in New York City are family units, right? Right. Kind of out of 60,000 people who are homeless, 25,000 are children. Mm. But when we hear the word homeless, we just think about that guy in the street corner. Tokyo tonight. I love the organization that you have because I like the idea of bringing a human element to charity where it's not just a, a blank check and you don't get to see the faces of the people you're donating to or, um, you know, you don't really get to interact with anybody. It's almost like you've created like a soup kitchen environment to an extent, but a little bit more because they're actually eating with people. Right. Like that mm -hmm. is like you, you're not only just kind of like serving them food, but you're sitting down to have a, a conversation and to, and to kind of talk with them. Right. Yeah. I actually say that I like to flip flip the soup kitchen model on its head. I nice. want people to walk into a room where people are experiencing homelessness and people are living in homes in mm. Manhattan and you don't know who's homeless and who's not. And that's really my dream. That's pretty great. That's really nice. Cause it really, I mean, like, I, I, I don't know. It I sounds like, like a reality TV series waiting to happen <laughs> where, you, where they all stay in a house and you got to pick out which one was homeless and which one's living in a $3.5 million apartment. And who deserves it more? Like if the homeless guy like really kind of embodies the lifestyle of a really rich person, it's like, you know what? This guy is killing it. I don't, <laughs> I don't think you're going to get your home back, sir. I think, uh, I think this guy is now you. Honestly, it's a good pitch. Yeah. It's like <laughs> trading places, but for real. Yep. Is yeah. that the movie with Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd? Those, yeah, that you, you you nailed it. Okay, thank you. Those would be much higher stakes, right? Like if the guy yeah. with $3.5 million apartment ends up, now you're homeless. Sorry, guy. You lose. Yeah. This yeah. guy is now in your apartment. Yeah. It's like a Beauty and the Beast situation <laughs> where like this homeless woman comes to the door, but it's really a witch. And you're like, now you don't have a home. And you're and also you're ugly as fuck. Good luck getting women. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. That'd be nice, right? Um <laughs> Would that be great? You know, it'd be great if you brought if we did like a guilt thing where we brought homeless people door to door to rich people's houses and got them to know them. And then we're like, yeah, by the way, you like this guy? Well, also, he doesn't have a place to live and then really kind of convince them to I buy. That, that, that's what I feel like the charity does. It it humanizes the the problem I yeah. feel like that's what okay, most that is our secret mission, kind of. And in, nice. in some ways, I mean, not to quite the same extent, people know that they're at dinner with people who are living in shelters but all of a sudden they hear oh this guy you know used to work here this guy has this okay how can i help you you know who can i connect you with yeah. for maybe a yeah. job opportunity someone who i know in housing development that kind of stuff happens pretty naturally people don't realize how close they are to homelessness which always used to bother me like it really like the disconnect between like one minute you have a job and a family and a wife and whatever the hell your situation is and like within a week, you could have absolutely nothing like because I think some people like I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's I, I read something recently where people's perceptions of reality are always completely different. Right. Like there's people who are um, actually, you know, it's funny I'm not to bring. I think I was reading about depression is what I was reading about. But we can leave that part out of it. But I think it's like like people who are um, tend to be more depressed, have a really real review a real sense of reality like they understand the world around them they understand things on a level that maybe people who are walking around happy go lucky do not but i also think that same perception applies to like consequences and and how close you are to being broke which i think the pandemic kind of shifted for everybody because i think a lot of people live paycheck to paycheck and kind of survived as long as everything was stable and then as soon as it wasn't they realized oh i'm making i'm not making good money and and i am being taken advantage of and my government's not there for me at the end of the day. You know what I mean? Like it, it got very like, you know, dire straits almost. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's crazy how prevalent it is and how invisible we are to New York city, for example, mm. out of everyone who's homeless in New York city, street homelessness, like what is what we imagine, right? We imagine the guy 
holding up a cardboard sign. We imagine the woman with a shopping cart with tens of bottles. But yeah. the truth is street homelessness in New York City is only 5% of homelessness in New York City. Wow. Yeah. 95% are living in shelters. Right. And it's and listen, we have to give compassion and love to everyone, whether you're living in a shelter or on the streets, right? right. But the problem is people who are living in these beautiful buildings in Manhattan, for example, are like, no, 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 we don't want these people in our neighborhood. And a lot of that comes from the perception of our neighbors on the street. But right. they realize that 70% of people who are homeless in New York City are family units, right? Right. Talking about out of 60,000 people who are homeless, 25,000 are children. But mm. when we hear the word homeless, we just think about that guy in the street corner. Yeah, or the guy in the subway, like, screaming and, and scaring the shit out of people. And you're like, oh, God. Like, it's the worst representation, I think, sometimes. Yeah, and as someone who runs an organization around mm. homelessness, like, and I talk about this with my husband all the time, like, I'll walk into a subway car and, you know, obviously if someone's walking through the subway car and, like, sharing their story and their journey – you know, around homelessness, we always try to help, whether it's a pair of socks or yeah. like, here's my card, right? But then there are those people who are yelling on the subway carts, right? Mm -hmm. And in those cases, we switch train cars, right? Yeah, yeah. Scary, you know what I mean? And I'm someone totally. who works in this space, right? And it, it's such a small percentage, but unfortunately, that becomes the perception of everything. Right. And it's hard to probably fight back. Do you know what the, what, is there a specific number? Is it uh, of like, um, like, what would you say causes homelessness more? Is it the loss of a job or the inability to get work? Or is it more of a, um, like, mental issue? Like, what's the leading factor of so homelessness? The leading cause of homelessness is lack of affordable housing. Okay. That is the leading cause. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I would say, you know, there's a lot of questions and different answers in terms of percentage, et cetera, in terms of whether it comes to substance abuse or mental health mm -hmm. issues, right? All these different things. And I think a lot of times it's the chicken or the egg, right? Yeah. I think it's it's very often, okay, you lose your job, so you lose your housing. So then, you know, mm -hmm. underlying mental health issues come up or substance abuse comes to play, right? Uh, so I say a lot, of, you know, for the most part, it's you don't really know and it's hard to say exactly from that perspective. Right. Uh, but what I will say is there's a massive difference between our neighbors who are living on the streets and our neighbors who are living in shelters. And yeah. that's something that people don't realize. Yes, many of our neighbors who are living in shelters are dealing with mental health issues. Right. But so many people around the, you know, who are sure. working, right? when it comes to you know, depression, anxiety, stress, right? They're in the most stressful environment. So they are, you know, even more infected living yeah. in shelters by mental health issues. Uh, but I would say in terms of severe mental health issues that is something you see much more on for people who are living on the right. streets right and and that's why people come into our dinners and they're like should i be nervous should i be scared and they talk to everybody and like everyone is as lovely as can be and we really do break those stigmas around homelessness because shelter homelessness is very different than street homelessness and what happens very often is people are scared to go into the shelter so they'll spend a few nights on the bench which will end up being a year or two years. And then when you're living on the street for that long, and you have that many people who are avoiding eye contact with you, mm -hmm. right? And you have that it makes it uh, yeah. family networks. It becomes very clear, you know, yeah, that these mental health issues would arise. I mean, there obviously are some people who are struggling with those mental health issues and are going to the streets, but a lot of times it is actually living on the streets for X number of years that leads to those severe mental health issues. Right. People don't realize there's like, there's, there's just these domino effects sometimes that happen with that kind of stuff. And even getting to the point of homelessness is like, people don't realize that society in general has a way of keeping people who are poor, poor. And then it's just another step into a homeless, like, you know, from the clothing they have to buy, from the food they have to buy. Like I was trying to, I was explaining this to somebody else the other day where it's like, you know, rich people have the advantage of buying a jacket or something for the winter that will last them for 20 years. Whereas, you know, because they'll, they'll say like the, the, one of the stigmas is that like people who are poor will, you know, they always see them with new clothing. And I'm like, you you think you see them with. Yes, technically, it's quote unquote, a new jacket or whatever it is. But it's because the thing that they have to buy is still at technically out of their price range. But they that's what they can afford. But the quality is so bad that it breaks down by the time the winter's over. And then you have to go back and buy this another fucking jacket. And it just keeps you in this cycle 
of poverty because the quality of the, of the material you're getting isn't good. And that's it's the same for, you know, food and only being able to afford fast food. And then it also, you know, fast food's bad for your body. So it keeps you in the sicker and it makes you weaker. And it's this endless cycle. It's insane. Yeah, it was really interesting. So we've been doing these monthly meet your neighbor dinners now, um, mm -hmm. where every month is a different theme. So February was Black History Month, March was Women's History Month, April, mm -hmm. we did one for Earth Day. And oh. so we had, you know, one or two climate change speakers get up and share mm -hmm. their stories. And then one or two neighbors uh, who experience homelessness share their stories. And then a lot of people naturally just want to get up and share their stories. Yeah, and yeah. One guy was saying, you know, I grew up in the projects, like I grew up you know, in the hood. And he's like, I didn't really, you know, I, we used to have playgrounds that we played on. Mm. Like, they cut down all of those forests. So now even more kids in my community are going to the streets because they don't have backyards they can play in anymore. Right. right? And that was like such a wild way to think of how even climate change, you know, yeah. and and you know, deforestation and all these things that we're doing to our planet are not just affecting, you know, the, the planet, but Mother actually Earth, communities yeah. and cultures. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you, do, so you bring people into the shelter. Is there, um, how, how effective are, are you, like, do you guys see it in real time? Like, you know what I mean? Like where you, where they're making those connections. Do you see re people coming back in to do this repeatedly? Like you're, you're building so your own community. We actually, we don't do them in the shelter. Oh, you don't. Okay. We, we actually like when we partner up with a company, for example, if we do it at JP Morgan and we're doing it in their conference room, if we're doing oh, nice. it with Salesforce, we do it in their offices in their conference rooms. And there's something really special about that because, you know, our neighbors are seeing our big fancy buildings every day, but actually saying, Hey, welcome, come on in. Sure. It's something that's that's really powerful that happens. Um, but in terms of connections, it, my favorite thing is I'll get like a month later, I'll get a text of you know my friend sarah out to lunch with this new friend tracy that she met right who mm -hmm. live in a shelter or john and sam will meet up like that is happening That's all nice. the time i would say in terms of connections being made and then someone getting housing or getting their life magically back together is not what typically happens but that's mm -hmm. also not our focus of the events okay. because then it, would, it would lose a little bit of of the unique factor. There are people who are working to help people get housing. There are people who are working to create job training programs, mm -hmm. but there's nobody who's working to actually create relationships. And unfortunately people who are living mm -hmm. in shelters, this is my own statistic. There's obviously no numbers behind this, but I believe that the leading cause of homelessness is loneliness, wow. right? Because if you have a friend who has the resources and you can, you know, crash on their couch or you have family members, right? The reason why, you know, I could say, yeah, I could be homeless tomorrow. I could, you know, be living paycheck to paycheck. And, you know, I would say two years ago, I was living paycheck mm -hmm. to paycheck. Like mm -hmm. literally looked at my bank account every month. I was like, oh, shit, yeah. $60 in my bank account. Mm -hmm. But I knew that I can move back in with my parents. Yeah. I knew that I could stay at a friend's until I figured it out. Right? I had like probably 100 people I can call before I would get to that point. Right. Um, but a lot of people who have grown up in certain communities and growing up in poverty, right? You can't just crash on a friend's couch. You're an extra mouth to feed, right? Yeah. That's a lot more difficult. And then you fall into these hard times, but you don't want to burden other people. Right. And it just creates this space of lack of networks and really loneliness, not having people that you can rely on in these hard times. I love that because it is, it, it, I think any, anybody that's even going through something, even if it's an addiction type of thing, or they're having a hard time getting back on their feet, what, whatever the situation is, it's kind of weird because it's like, you really can do more for your, for, for people, for anybody. And it, I don't know if it's when we get older, we start to just like, you know, get, get more fractured. You know what I mean? Like people feel like they have less time because like when I, you know, <clears throat> even on a very small scale, I feel like when you know, people I know when we're, we're all younger, there's like not a minute where we're all not trying to figure out how to hang out with each other. When I had an apart, you know, like uh, people would be there all the time. I had like an open door policy, friends, stuff like that. And it's kind of funny when you see people as they get older, kind of desocialize almost, right? Mm -hmm. They convince themselves they're busy. Same way with helping people though, too. It's like, yeah, if somebody's in need, what is it going to cost you to put them on your couch for like a fucking few months or something like that or have the spare bedroom available or or whatever it is like is it really going to disrupt your life like that much to make sure that somebody's being taken care of i don't think so um and you know i don't i don't think it's i think maybe what they, john's it, saying is 
Someone I need a place over. to stay. He's, he, see, I was gonna, yeah. oh, I was gonna, oh, you were going to go the other way? I was going to be like, this is a fake background. I would really, really much like to. Um, I, well, actually, I, you're, you're bringing me back to something that's really interesting that I never thought about in the context of my work. I've thought about it in the context of my life. Um, my parents throughout my life, like there were like a couple different family friends that went through difficult times. And mm. it was not uncommon for me to have a family friend who was sleeping in our guest bedroom for a few months at a wow. time, sometimes up to a year, you yeah, know, yeah. or, you know, one friend's parents was having a hard time. So the child would stay at our family's house. You mm -hmm. know, when I say child, we were also children. It was just like a really yeah. long sleepover that we would get. And it's something that they actually did pretty often. I would say even a few months, like the last, you know, last month we had someone who was living at our house for three months because it was, I mean, all these people are close family friends, but like, they were dealing with something within their marriage and, you know, he needed a yeah. place to sleep for a few months. And it's just my family has done this repeatedly. Yeah. Uh, so it's interesting to think about the space that I'm in now mm -hmm. uh, in that context. Yeah, it's cool. And I've, I've done the same. I mean, like I when I moved out to California, I had no place to stay and I bounced around for people like until I figured out what I was doing and where I could live and whatever and i remember people being like yeah absolutely if you don't mind staying on a futon and it was like fine but i'll sleep on your car like it's fine by me as long as it's like you know you don't care it's it's just nice to have that community but not you're right not everybody has it yeah and and what's interesting is i think you're right i think as as we get older people become less open and, to that concept as well yeah I, and it's weird because it's just it's not i think when they're presented with it they're like oh okay yeah it's not that big a deal but i think they don't initially go out of their way to do it. So it's, I like that you're forcing it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you're like, you're like literally for like an hour at a time, just over <laughs> dinner. <laughs> yeah, that's great. What, um, so how did the, how did the give a sock concept come about though? Like what is, sure. explain that a little bit. Sure. By the way, I love that we just got like dove into this conversation. Usually I like to jump into how it starts and then we get into these like longer conversations. Um, I, I do everything a little backwards, but it's fine. <laughs> it's so important. So a whole bunch of years ago, I was a sophomore in college at NYU. And mm -hmm. I was giving out sandwiches to some of my neighbors on the street. And mm -hmm. one guy said, ma'am, it's so nice you're giving out sandwiches. But one thing we could really use are socks. And I very quickly realized my socks weren't going to fit him. Mm -hmm. I decided to go and knock on every door on the floor. In about 15 minutes, I got over 40 pairs of socks. Wow. Fast forward to my senior year of college, we spread to over 20 college campuses and collected over 50,000 pairs of socks, which is when I say I became a sock celebrity. <laughs> people, would me, people would ask me to come speak in their schools or their synagogues or their churches or their college classrooms about what we were doing. And I'd always ask the audience two questions. So I'm going to ask them to you guys. Oh, okay. Given money, food, or clothing to someone in need yes. in a donation box or in person. Absolutely. Yes. The next question I ask, and if your answer is yes, well, you're just a really good person. <laughs> the next question I ask is, can you tell me the name of one person experiencing homelessness? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, so you guys are the exceptions to the rule. Mm. Typically, I ask those questions in college classroom or in a corporate space, and the first question, everyone raises their hand. Mm. And then the second question Almost no one raised their hand. Wow. Almost no one can tell you the name of someone oh, experiencing homelessness. I can give you like five right now. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, that's why I'm on your podcast. You guys are the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> I um, actually, I was in Chicago. I went to, I've told the story too many times on this podcast, but one time I went to the airport. I was like, send me someplace I've never been, right? So I ended up in Chicago and I asked everybody on my journey, what's your dream? What's your passion? Why don't you pursue it? And Chicago has a really high number of homeless. So I did it a lot with homeless people. And so, but in the same thing, I would pass out food. I would pass, I wouldn't pass out money because I always felt like people could try to get, you know, stuff that you wouldn't want them to get, be a bad influence. But I gave out like food. I gave out a uh, video games, Metro card because they could ride the subway at night so they could sleep because they weren't able because it was too cold. That's outside. smart. That's Crazy. really nice. That wasn't my idea. That was one of their ideas. Oh, so, Metro card's a great amazing. idea, though. I didn't even think of that. Yeah. And I would ask their whole story on how they got there. So I learned a lot of people's journeys. Hmm. Wow. on that they were the, uh, the most moving instance in that entire trip and it was a pretty long trip was uh i met one guy i had already given i went to a pizzeria like the chicago deep dish but they don't sell it by the slice they would only sell the pie so i'm like whatever it's one of me and i could eat don't get me wrong but chicago's a filling pie so i was like could you do me a favor and wrap all the leftovers individually i want to hand it out on my way back to the hotel 
right? So they did that. And the guy was really nice. He included like extra stuff, whatever they had extra. He gave me a giant bag of food. Mm -hmm. So I'm passing it out the whole way, blah, blah, blah. As I'm getting to the hotel, I'm done passing everything out. I run into this guy sleeping in a windowsill. And he's like, hey, do you have any money for food? I'm like, oh, I was like, I gave it out already. I was like, give me five minutes. My hotel's right over there. I'm going to go up. I'll order room service. I'll bring you back something to eat. Right. So I did that. And I went back down, brought him back the food. And we started talking. We're just sitting there. And it was cold, cold, right? Like bitter. It was in January. So uh, he's like, listen, he's like, I, uh, I found this earring, a diamond earring on the floor, like one. So he's like, I found this earring on the floor tomorrow. He's like, I'm going to go to the pawn shop. I'm going to get some money for it. He's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy uh, chicken with it. He's like, you're welcome to meet me for lunch. You're welcome to some of my chicken. And I was like, oh, no, thank you so much. I was like, that was really moving because that's almost everything this guy has, right? right? I'm like, no, don't worry. It's okay. He's like, I understand I'm not sanitary. You could, I'll open the box. You could touch it first. I was like, oh, that was heartbreaking, right? Yeah. So I was like, what a moving like moment that was. Like, this guy's giving me half of what he has. It's hard to get yeah. gum from John. So it just tells you the character. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Wow. Yeah. No, it, it is. It's crazy. I mean, and it's funny, people, the reactions people have, too, were like, I think, uh, uh, like, I, you know, this is, I won't even mention the name of the of the place in L in LA, but I was doing this one club and they gave everybody sandwiches and I just grabbed a bunch of stuff and was like, there were, you know, homeless people outside, but I would pass them all the time as a comment. You know what I mean? Like, and, you know, have a dialogue, yada, yada, hand them some, whatever. But when they gave us a bunch of food, I was like, oh, they're not going to do anything with these sandwiches at the end of the thing. And I grabbed, they were free for us. And I gave them and like they got pissed because they were like, you know, oh, you know, if you if you feed them, they'll come. I'm like, they're not fucking pigeons. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, like and it, but the mentality is a, is a hard. I imagine that's a hard thing to change within, you know, society and other people, too, is like, yeah, you sure. really need to treat these people like people. When we first wanted to start doing our meet your neighbor dinners and we had the radical idea of bringing people who are homeless to your office. It was, mm -hmm. you know, it was wild. So. Um, as I mentioned, so I would ask those two questions to different audiences oh, right. and you guys are the exceptions to the rule, but actually mm -hmm. most people, you know, in a room of a hundred people, maybe two or three people raise their hand and say yes. And this has happened time and time and time wow. again, okay. uh, where most people have been involved in this transaction of giving, but don't actually know anybody personally who's experienced wow. homelessness and are completely disconnected. And on a liberal college campus where, you know, NYU, everyone's super politically correct, careful about the way they're speaking. All of a sudden, when it comes to homelessness, it's like, aren't most people who are homeless choosing to be homeless? <laughs> no, most of them have mental illness. Like we say mental wellness now, mental health, you know, <laughs> um, it, we, you know, aren't most people who are homeless doing drugs or alcoholics and these huge stereotypes wouldn't none of these people could actually even name to you one person who's experienced homelessness. Right. So my senior year of college, I decided to bring 50 of my college classmates and 50 people living in local shelters to have dinner side mm -hmm. by side. But we made a strict rule. No one was allowed to serve anybody else food. Oh. All the food was family style and we had ice breakers on the table. And our second rule was you had to sit next to someone who you didn't know before walking into that room. Nice. So by the end of the meal, we had college students saying, you know, we can't tell who's homeless and who's not. They met moms who couldn't afford childcare, dads working minimum wage jobs, people who got out of prison and couldn't get jobs afterwards. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, homelessness had a name and a face and a story to it. Nice. And all this sock collection was always just like kind of a side project. Even when my parents were like, you need to get the socks out of our garage. And I had to <laughs> raise just a couple thousand dollars to put them into storage. Right. But aside from that, the whole thing was meant to be just this side project. And after I had done this dinner, I was like, this is amazing. And this is amazing for college students. But the only way to really create change in the homelessness space is to create stakeholders. You know, like really mm -hmm. people who have power and influence. They need to care about homelessness. It doesn't matter if college students care about homelessness. They have all the time in the world. Right, yeah. We need people who have power and resources to really care about homelessness. So that's when I got this crazy. It's like, I want these meet your neighbor dinners to be with Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan and Salesforce and all of these big companies. And I want them to be sitting and having meet your neighbor dinners. Yeah. But I realized that we needed to literally get our sock in the door <laughs> so I was like, we're not listen to like a nice little college graduate who's like yeah. feet tall and be like let's do a dinner with you and let's bring people 
who are experiencing homelessness to your office. That would be like a whole door slam in my face. Right. But right. if I can get these companies to collect socks in their office, and then mm -hmm. whoever I'm working with on that, I can say, hey, why don't we have your employees actually meet the recipients of these sock donations by having nice. dinner side by side in your oh, office? Okay. Even the language changes. And then we do these meet your neighbor dinners. And by the end, you have, you know, people – corporate executive saying, you know, do you know when I was talking to my neighbor, Tom, he actually told me this crazy thing, X, Y, Z. And it even, I don't tell people to change their language, but all of a sudden people are naturally changing their language and referring to the guy who lives in a shelter as their neighbor. Right. And we're just very naturally changing the language and the narrative around homelessness in a way that's not so in your face. It's just a corporate employee engagement opportunity. Yeah. And so that's really, uh, after I graduated my senior year of college, I decided to start turning transactions into interactions through Knock Knock Give a Sock. Um, the first year of college, I out of college, I was living off savings for a year and hustling to try to raise wow. the money to be able to do this full time. By the end of the year, I got there. Um, and now, you know, five years later, although I like to say three years later, because COVID really stole like two years. Of our Tell work. me about it. Yeah. But, um, you know, five years later, I have two employees who work with me. Um, so it's a th team of three of us and we've been super fortunate and it's really grown. That's awesome. That's I like you. You have a mission to make everybody sexually active. <laughs> exactly. I, I think exactly. that's beautiful. And we have three different ways. Our pillar, we have our pillar. Number one is we distribute half a million socks a year while actually hire people living in shelters. Uh, oh. to help us distribute those socks through our mm -hmm. Soxess job program. Mm -hmm. okay. Second is we do meet your neighbor lunches and dinners, both with communities, you know, that we host on our own with different themes like Mother's Day, Black History right. Month, Earth Day, um, and with corporate offices and those partnerships. Uh, and three, we do a holiday carnival every year for over 300 kids living in shelters in New nice. York City. So we do do one event uh, for the kids. And then this fourth, this COVID pivot uh, is these books. Beautiful. Love that. And you did that during the pandemic when you couldn't um, do the live events, right? Yeah. So I was really inspired when, unfortunately, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, there were many shelters that were moving into hotels in these pretty well-to-do neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the families were like, we don't want them here. There were petitions. Like, wow. it was just wow. a really big mess. And I was, I was like, how do we talk to our kids how do we talk to families about homelessness and that's when this first book came to me called knock knock give a sock mm -hmm. and it's about a Beautiful. little girl who starts collecting socks for her neighbors on the street and ends up getting nicknamed the sock fairy so it's basically me as a five-year-old nice. um but it actually tells the neighbors stories on the street like as she's meeting them she learns their stories in a way that would be appropriate to tell a little kid uh, oh that's so that great so that's really cool. Um, and then the other book I realized, first I was just going to do this one book, and then I realized there are so many kids who are living in shelters who mm -hmm. who need to be able to see themselves as heroes as well. Mm -hmm. And I ordered every single children's book on homelessness for kids nice. that have kids living who are, are homeless. And there was one about a girl who lives in a car, and like the whole time you just wanted to cry. There was about a kid living in an airport, and you just wanted to cry. There was one that was a little bit happier, but it was like the mom pretending that the shelter was a spaceship, as mm -hmm. opposed to just acknowledging that it's a shelter. Right. And I realized that we needed to change the narrative. So that's when I wrote Knock Knock, Where's My Sock? And it's about a little girl whose family moves into a family shelter. But during the move, she loses the matching pair to her lucky sock, and she only has one. Oh. He thinks, what could I do if I just have one? She tries it on as a bracelet. It's too big. She tries it as a bag. It's too small. She ends up putting it over her eyes like a superhero mask. And <laughs> she started a superhero club, the Super Sock Hero Club, mm -hmm. where other kids in the shelter also wore sock masks, and they ended up doing random acts of kindness throughout New York City, and they got recognized by the city for the work that they did. That's you great. Know? And so the idea is you have two little girls in two different housing situations who mm -hmm. both make an impact in their neighborhood, regardless of their housing status. And that's why we call it the pair of books project, because it's a pair of books. And nice. It's together that's like fun. this. Um, but yeah, where can so they, they find them? Where can we find them? You can find them on Amazon. Okay. Um, just type in knock, knock, give a sock on Amazon and they'll come up. 
Or if you go to our website, kkgs.org, mm -hmm. and you'll see at the top, there's like how to get involved, our sock partners, us in the media. And then there's one tab that says books, and that'll take you there as well. Very nice. That's fun. Yeah. And what, so at the end, I mean, are you going to do more, more books? And now that things have opened back up, because I know you've got a, um, a Mother's Day benefit uh, thing coming up in, in, on Mother's Day, right? You're doing it at yeah, the end Yeah, on Mother's Day, Day this Sunday. Yeah. Yes, this Sunday. So this what? Sunday, we're actually bringing you. <laughs> I gotta get a gift. <laughs> it's what now? <laughs> uh, this Sunday, we're bringing 25 moms living in homes and 25 moms living in shelters to have a Mother's Day brunch side by side. Nice. If you're a dad or a partner or a kid over the age of 12 and you also want to come, it's great. We put you in the other room with all the kids and we have a mini carnival going on for all the kids, which is oh, great. We make all the dads cool. be volunteers so that the moms could have a nice brunch mm -hmm. <laughs> away from all the kids. That's a that's a smart move. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> all the dads will come out like tons of face paint over their faces. <laughs> uh, in terms of the books, the truth is uh, it's an interesting question that you ask me. Right now, the plan isn't to write more books. We're actually getting super busy and we're going back to our in-person events. Cool. But these books uh, were valuable for two reasons. One, we were able to get our word out, you know, and messages to humanize homelessness during the pandemic through these mm -hmm. books. Um, but also we were able to raise a significant amount of funding from the books, which actually you know, helped us through the pandemic. So yeah, now right. with the books, I'm in this funny place of trying to figure out, you know, we sold half of them in the first few months. And now we have this whole second half of our, the batches of books left that we're mm -hmm. trying to get out there. So now I'm partnering up with people like you guys to get our word out there. So we continue getting the message. And once we finish selling uh, all the sets of books that we have, because we, we ordered them all together, actually, they were, uh, they were printed in Ukraine. So it's pretty crazy. I was in the touch oh, wow. like, a wow. lot of people who were in charge of printing and, you know, this happened a year before everything that is going on now, but it was crazy during the process. I was like texting people when you were living there. Yeah. Who these books. Oh, um, the next question is, you know, do I part once we finish selling all of our books, we still have a way to go. Mm -hmm. But the question is figuring out how to partner with the publishing agency and having them push it out or us doing yeah. another reprint. Uh, so we definitely, I think these books are really powerful. There's no plan for new books in the future right now. Uh, but hopefully if we create some strong partnerships along the way, who knows? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm I'm yeah. I'm stunned that nobody's jumped on it yet to get those books out there and to publish those. They look lovely. Who was the who's the artist that did the uh, drawings? I found you know, I had a friend, an old roommate starts. whose cousin is mm -hmm just graduated high school and was in her gap year after college. And it was a great cheap way to get, the, yeah. you know, illustrations and they're beautiful. They're yeah. Beautiful. They look great. And like at half price. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's always the best way to go about it. Yeah. I mean, it's great. They look, they look really cool. Um, well, I just, I have to ask you the last three questions we ask every guest, but I wanted to thank you for coming on and sharing your story and everything with us. Cause that is, I, I, I any way we can help. Um, I would, I know Tom would be on volunteering. I, Tom, I, have, I have a bunch of fun ideas. I feel like we could crush yeah. it. I feel like we, I feel like number one, the knock, knock, give a sock thing makes me want to do like some sort of a fundraiser with just like comedians selling one knock, knock joke and just yeah. have one to one to one to one to one to one to one, like the whole way through. I think I love that. sock. Yeah. Right. Love that. Yeah. 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 I'm here we for should it. do some That's stuff. Amazing. That'd be a lot of yeah. fun. I'd we love just to. want to raise enough to be able to give two socks. So they have a yeah. Point. Yeah, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that's it. That's I'm I'm like, really, that is really awesome that you do this kind of work. And, and you know, um, I, I like the idea of actually eating. That's that's interesting with them, because I when I, I worked at a soup kitchen before, but it was kind of until I read about your thing, I realized, yeah, you guess you weren't really making you're not really making a, enough of a connection, just kind of handing out the food and then they kind of leave. When you and worked there, did you talk to them? Did you get like a chance I did. to really, when like, engage the... and interact with people? Yes, well, but only within the only within the, lo the line, you know what I mean? So it is, you know, it's you're not really getting somebody's full story as you're kind of moving it along, you know? So it was, you know, I got to hang out and hang around afterward and there would be regulars that you would see and get to know. But the idea wasn't having dinner with them. It wasn't sitting down like you weren't sitting down to eat. And it was the tables were for them and. You know, they got There's to lack of connection. I feel like that's the big yeah. thing is that you're able to connect with people and hear their story. There's so many people out there that are homeless that are very functional homeless where they oh, like, yeah. have a gym membership. They, they're able to do like if you listen to the stories, it's like you couldn't tell unless you knew. Yeah. You have no idea. 
There was a guy when I used to work at the library, there was one dude who, um, and I still know him and I still see him uh, every now and again, but he would come to the library and he had like, it, it, you know, same stereotypical thing where people would be like, oh, he chooses this, yada, yada, but because he had a laptop and it's like, well, dude, somebody gave him the, like, he was always trying to do whatever it is he did, whether, I, whether you know, like, I think he was like, he would always, he was always reading law books and he always had this dearth of knowledge. If you just sat down and talked to him, you know, he's a very interesting guy. But it, but people had this perception because he had certain things, which is so weird to me because people, it's like, you know, so critical about people having phones. Or yeah. Laptops. And it's like, that's what you, literally you can, just because you can get those doesn't mean you could afford rent every month consistently. So why not invest on things that could actually help you with connections? Right. And, yeah. And, and it's also, just, it's just insane to me that it's like, dude, it's like, you know, what, what do you what do you want these people to do in general? Even if you're even if you're just, you know, poverty stricken and you're on food stamps and like, you know, you shouldn't be eating good food if you're on food stamps. Why? Like your quality of life is so shit to begin with. Anyway, why not get happiness where you can absolutely get it? Like, I, you know, my, my parents were on food stamps when I was younger. We were we were I mean, my friends didn't nobody knew. But like the, when I was a kid, that was just what it was. You know what I mean? And I didn't really know too much when I was a kid, but I did growing up. You know, and like my my mom, when I was a kid, uh, when I was really, really young, you know, for me, in order to have birthdays, she would sell furniture um, that she had gotten because she wanted me to have a good birthday. So I was very fortunate as a kid to not particularly understand or realize that we didn't have a lot of money at the time, but we didn't. And and but it's weird that people would be like, why do you have nice? Why do you have this? If whatever. Well, because quality of life is also important too. like. You know, you want to give your kid a birthday party, even though you don't, you know, and sell some tables and chairs or whatever that you have just to make it happen. Or, you know, it, it's it's frustrating. And it's, me, it would be amazing that if like you carry that like as a tradition in your head that every time like your birthday was coming, you got rid of the couch. <laughs> <laughs> no couch. That's a great but that's a great way to do it. Right. I think that's not too bad. But you didn't I, realize that it happened. You just yeah, like, oh, we I feel like that's a minimal there. lifestyle. Like I didn't, yeah. you know, yeah. Where you're like, oh, you want the Flintstones play set? You better get rid of that fucking love seat. <laughs> there uh, goes the lazy boy. <laughs> yeah. There goes the not the TV. <laughs> I don't need Legos really that bad. It's really interesting. Like, I think we all, all of us splurge, you know, in certain ways that are beyond our means, right? But if you're homeless and you spend beyond your means or you splurge, all of a sudden, all this criticism is pointed your way. Well, well the funny thing is, is that you mentioned when you were talking about people, I think, uh, I don't know if it was in just in the uh, uh, working world or in college or whatever it was, but people's reaction would be like, oh, don't they do drugs and alcohol? And it's kind of like, well, don't you, you yeah. fucking ass? Like, right. what are you talking about? Like, like, it, how could you possibly be judging somebody who like, College oh, drinking levels are that of an alcoholic. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like nine, 25 stories just went through my head. I was like, yes, I agree. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, absolutely. So it's kind of funny to me that people would judge somebody like that should be, a, a connecting tissue i think between the two is like yeah dude and you're that much closer because you do do that much. you do drink that much or do drugs like it's a slippery slope yeah. yeah to everything yeah people in this country don't realize how close they are to to being poor or or to just to being homeless it's wild um but that's a one major wheel. illness they say everybody's like one major illness away from like well, yeah everybody but majority of americans are one major surgery financial catastrophe away from like yeah being financially yeah. bankrupt. Also, Crazy. people need to stop having kids. That's my message. No, I'm just kidding. Just <laughs> sorry, that was weird. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, everybody. It's fine. Um, yeah, but anyway, uh, I got to ask you the last three questions that we ask every guest. So uh, brace yourself. First one is, um, if you go back in time, talk to your younger self, what piece of advice would you give yourself that would help you today? Oh my gosh. Wow. Okay, how young we talk? I guess any age, right? Well, what age would you want to talk? Yeah, it's any age, but like if you if you're thinking in your head, when would you like to speak to yourself at a younger age? What would okay. what age would you go back to? And how serious do we have to be? Oh, no, dude, it's, up, it's up to you. Honestly, like I wet the bed till I was nine years old, and I feel like I should have gotten that shit under a little bit earlier like it was so embarrassing for sleepovers. Like, come on, you get your shit together. Yeah. So probably like I give them, like like five-year-old self like a pep talk like come on like kindergarten's happening now we gotta stop this <laughs> <laughs> Whereas, like, kindergarten some really serious shit like, i wasn't i was like it's yeah. fine just give me my pull-ups we gotta get you in touch with uh, sarah silverman she's got that great book in the playout now called the bedwetter yeah. really i didn't know that yeah you didn't know that 
I did not. I swear to yeah. God. Yeah. Sarah Silverman's got a book out. She had a book out years ago called The Bedwetter. I'm not going to lie. Going back to your five-year-old self and try to yell at yourself about wetting the bed is probably going to do more scarring. I don't know. <laughs> I... I mean, that's that's we, a drama waiting to happen. <laughs> we had talked. We had, we had talked to some guests about like literally having to go back in time and shit. Because what what was it? One guest. We can cut this part out of, out of the whole episode, but I'll just say it on the air now. But like you know, some guests would be like, "I would go back and tell myself to sleep with more people." I'm like, "Could you imagine going back to your younger <laughs> self and just shake like an old man shaking it?" You know. <laughs> Be more promiscuous. I'm like, that would be scarring enough as it is. Like, could you not do that to yourself? That's a rough one. And so that is a rough one. Um, people have regrets. I don't know. Um, so uh, second question is, what had to end in your life, good or bad, that led you to where you are today? Mm, whoa. Okay. My senior year of college, when I was like about to go into doing this full time, and it was scary, you know, I was like, in this place of like gonna have one year to live on my savings, you know, mm -hmm. like kid knock, not give a sock, re like are any corporate companies gonna even want to do a dinner with us? That's only like functional, like right. financial model we have. Otherwise, people just give us socks and you can't buy potatoes with socks, you know? Yeah. Um, so towards the end of my, you know, senior year of college, people would always say, Dina, what are you doing afterwards? And I'd be like, I think I'm gonna start this organization full time. I think I'm going to go into it. And my dad gave me one speech. He said, Adina, your toes in the water, either jump in or walk away. Like stop telling people like you might do it or you're thinking about doing it. Um, he just basically said, dive in or walk away. And since that day I dove in and I haven't looked back. Uh, so I don't know if that quite answers your question, but that's kind of what came to mind. Yeah. That good. Yeah, that was great. Uh -huh. Um, and the last question is, if this is a genuine dystopia, everybody's last day on Earth, so zombies, aliens, uh, comet headed, whatever, whatever dystopia you'd want to imagine, how would you uh, like to go out? What would be your epic death? Whoa. <laughs> <clears throat> Honestly. Wow. OK, I think. I would want it to be like super instantaneous like the world just like erupts but like mm -hmm. we all know it's gonna be painless we all know it's gonna happen in like one second so that we all like just come together for like an epic burning man like experience where we're all just like <laughs> dancing and raving together love it that's I'm great to, i'm trying to get tickets to burning man this year so <laughs> the powers that be, if you have one it could be our Epic last day on Earth together. Oh, that's great. That's nice. Yeah, you can get <laughs> you can get the conspiracy theorists to come to Burning Man as well. Like, yes, that's great. That'd be amazing. Um, thank you so much. It was lovely meeting you. Um, we'll like we'll be in touch because I really kind of want to get involved in everything. This is so great. Thank you so much. Oh my God, sorry. I started. No, that's fine. On the middle. No, that was this a very is unique crazy. noise. I didn't even know what it was. I was like, the fuck is that going? Um, really so somebody awesome. calling with burning man tickets obviously <laughs> yes <Yeah. Sorry. laughs> oh, that's great um but yeah seriously thank you so much for coming on it was lovely meeting you thank yeah. you this was so great i'm looking forward to speaking to you guys soon yeah. dystopia tonight